Okay, welcome everyone to tonight's fellows lecture. These lectures are an opportunity to showcase the work of our teachers at Davenant Hall, which recently opened registration for our Trinity term courses, which begin in April. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Bradford Littlejohn. Dr. Littlejohn is the founder and president of the Davenant Institute, which launched shor shortly after he completed his PhD in theological ethics at the University of Edinburgh in 2013. His doctoral research focused on Richard Hooker's solution to the problem of authority in Protestant hermeneutics, ecclesiology, and political theory, and he has continued to research and publish on Richard Hooker since that time, most notably in his books, Richard Hooker, A Companion to His Life and Work, and The Peril and Promise of Christian Liberty. Since 2016, he has also spearheaded an initiative here at the Davenant Institute to translate Hooker's writings into modern English. He also serves as a senior fellow of the Edmund Burke Foundation and speaks and publishes widely on the topics of conservative political thought, Protestant political theology, Christian ethics, and Reformation history. He will be speaking tonight on the topic, Pride, Prejudice, and Precisionism, Richard Hooker on why we can't get along. His lecture should run for about 50 minutes or so, after which we'll take a quick five minute break, followed by half an hour or so of Q&A. And with that, uh, Dr. Littlejohn, please take it away. All right. Thank you, Michael. All right. Thank you very much for joining us tonight uh, remotely here for this fellow's lecture. Um, I want to extend a particular thank you to um, the Chapel of the Cross in Dallas, Texas, where I was invited to give a lecture series last fall on this theme. And uh, the lecture tonight is a sort of... Um, it's adapted from that. There's a, there's a lot of new material, but uh, if you, if you happen to watch the recording of that lecture already online, you can, you know, I don't know, you can, you can tune out now because some of it will be familiar. Um, but uh, I've condensed some of that material into one lecture and I'm very grateful to that uh, congregation for the opportunity to explore some of these ideas. So uh, the, the topic of my talk tonight is conflict, conflict in the church and society. Now, you hardly need me to tell you that we're not doing a great job of getting along in the church today and in American society particularly. Indeed, laments over polarization have become such a common refrain that uh, conflict is in danger of becoming a boring topic of conversation. Everybody is talking about conflict and polarization now. So for the first time, I'm, we're at risk of, of getting tired of talking about controversy. Now, 10 to 15 years ago, when I was getting my education, the big thing that everyone was lamenting, it seemed to me, was still conflicts within the church. Protestants, in particular, were constantly wringing their hands about all of the divisions within the Protestant church. Why is it that we Protestants are so divided? Why can't we get along with each other on issues like baptism or creation or Calvinism? And this was at least seemed to be a leading reason behind conversions to uh, Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy. People were seeking communions that seemed to be less divided. Now, um, I think it's perhaps depressing to note that um, conflicts such as that seem rather passe now. It seems, you know, with, with some of the issues that we're facing now, it seems like, oh, those, those good old days back when we used to just argue about Calvinism and Arminianism. Uh, now, many, I mean, that's not because we, these conflicts are resolved. We still have just as much division, I think, in the church as we used to. But the debate, the old debates that used to divide the church have now paled in comparison with those that seem to align with broader culture war trends. Indeed, for the past decade at least, it seems fair to say that even within the church, political polarization tends to be far more intense than traditional theological debate. I don't think this happened all at once. A lot of people like to blame one particular person or election cycle for this polarization, but it wasn't 2020 or 2016 or 2012 per se that led to this situation of polarization. I think it's been um, happening for quite a while and each four year presidential campaign tends to provide a particular uh, accelerant, an initial dump of kerosene on the fire. But I think 
the important thing to note is that it's not even really political conflict per se that is the real driver of polarization any more than in the church, it's traditional theological conflict. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when people still used to argue passionately, but at least somewhat rationally about topics as unsexy as social security reform. I feel like nowadays we get very worked about politics, but we're not even really often debating political issues in the traditional sense. Rather, politics and to some extent, to a great extent, debates within the church as well, have become symbols, flashpoints within a broader identity conflict within society. The particular issues that we fight about serve as symbols or shibboleths. They are identity markers of tribal allegiances that they, and they prove that you care about the right things. It's not so much, it's, I mean, people aren't, it's not the particular issue per se that they care about, it's that the fact that you hold this position on this issue proves that you are the right sort of person, that you are on the right side, that you're not, you're not going soft, perhaps. Uh, that's one concern, you know, on the, on the right, it's always the concern that you're going soft. On the left, it's always the concern that you're, you're a hater or whatever. And whatever view you take on different theological or political issues, very often, it's not that issue per se that's the conflict. It's the symbol of what tribe you are showing you belong to. And I think we, we can see this, for instance, just in the past year with things like uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and particular things around that, where rhetoric and symbols and certain uh, actions that people took were ways of signaling their commitment to certain things, either in a positive way or, or people um, were turned off by anything that had anything to do with, with BLM, not because they didn't care about racial justice in principle, but because of everything it seemed to be associated with. Similarly, something like mask wearing, as we've seen, has become a symbolic way of showing your tribal allegiance. Now, why do we take ourselves and these battles with such deadly, and sometimes literally deadly, seriousness? Uh, this is, you know, there's, there's loads to say here, and this is really just, just introductory at this point, so I just wanna make a few brief remarks. But I think it's worth noting that for the first time in history, most people in the Western world, uh, and in some people incre increasingly outside the Western world, are growing up with radical choice, all right? That is to say, with the ability to choose most of the conditions, or many of the conditions within which they will live their lives. America has been a bit ahead of the curve in this, but probably even in America, it wasn't until the late 1800s or so that the average person had much choice about where they were going to live. Large scale migration was quite exceptional. And it wasn't until maybe 75 years ago that the average person had much practical choice about what they were going to do for a living. Not that much long, not long after that, birth control means that child rearing becomes a matter of choice. Women are faced soon with the choice of are they going to go into the workplace or not? And not long after that, you, the choice of what sexual orientation you're going to be or even what gender you're going to be opens up for the first time as a viable choice, something that everyone is expected to make a choice about. And that's the important thing here to note, right? Um, these are not, it's not as if if you want more choices, you've got more choices, but if you don't want more choices, that's fine. You could just stay in your shell. Rather, as Oliver O'Donovan wrote presciently in 1982, once sex change surgery enters the pop pop public consciousness, those who live happily in the sex of their birth will be seen as having chosen to do so. The same thing happens with our homes, our vocations, and our denominations in the church, right? 75 years ago, most people would have just been born into a certain church tradition, a certain denomination that their parents had been members of, and they might not even think about whether they were going to switch from the Lutheran church to the Baptist church or, or vice versa, right? But nowadays, we are surrounded by the awareness of choice. We are aware of people around us who have chosen differently. And so even those of us who want to stay stubbornly just where we are, 
Now we experience this differently. We stay where we are because we've chosen to do so, not because it's been given to us. Now, what is the result of this? The result of this is not in fact individualism, as we are so often told, but tribalism. We cannot genuinely subsist as individuals, so we instinctively seek out others like us. But now we are seeking out others not who just are like us, who are born like us, but others who have chosen like us. We group together in groups of shared choices. And because these communities are chosen rather than given, forged rather than received, they often acquire a certain militant zeal and defensiveness, which can be lacking in more traditional communities. I mean, traditional communities can be very defensive uh, about their identity as well, but it's all the more so when there's the sense of this is something that we have chosen to commit ourselves to. And therefore these groups define themselves in opposition to all others. They vigorously police dissent and they can present themselves as the only viable future. And we see that across the church and society today. One more issue just to note here is that uh, what I call the problem of disagreement overload, which is to say, again, if we go back 100, 200 years, the average person is aware that there are people with different views on different topics, but they might go through their entire life not encountering that broad of a spectrum of belief. And if they do, it's probably only going to be in their adult life. They're going to sort of grow up relatively sheltered. And so you sort of gradually learn how to deal with disagreement, how to deal with the fact that there's somebody who sees the world very differently than you do. But we don't have that gradual culturation anymore. From early childhood, we are exposed to this radical choice, to the fact that there are, even if, even if we're raised again in households that, that say, well, this is the only right way to do it, we are aware that out there, there are other people doing things completely differently. Other people, there are, you know, you have an eight-year-old kid who knows there's another eight-year-old kid who's reconsidering what gender they are. And so we are barraged with disagreement, with diversity of belief, with the question of, well, I hold this, but someone else holds this, am I really sure of it? On every conceivable topic, which leads to a radical insecurity. I mean, we're just not made to live with that much, um, that, that much disagreement from that early on. So this insecurity expresses itself in anger and defensiveness. And then of course you have, and part of what I'm referring to here is of course the role of mass media, social media. But I mean, even in the last 10, 15 years, um, social media particularly has accelerated many of these sources of conflict. This isn't something I'm gonna deal with further tonight, um, but I commend to you the movie, uh, the documentary, The Social Dilemma, if you haven't seen it yet, which is very important on this subject. And we can talk more about this in the Q and A if you like. Now, should we get along? Now, everything I've said so far would seem to propose, presuppose that the massive cultural division and conflict is a bad thing. But didn't Jesus say, I came not to bring peace, but a sword? I come to bring division on the earth? While many of us are burnt out on conflict, many of us have also learned to be reflexively suspicious of those, particularly those in the church, who just call for everyone to set aside their dogmatisms and get along, right? We, we, we all know plenty of people, there are plenty of voices in the world today that just say conflict is bad, controversy is bad, it's a sign of hate. Why, especially why can't we as Christians just set aside these differences? And it's important to remember uh, that Jesus himself teaches that conflict can be good. Now, and in fact, it's worth observing that radical tolerance, such as many people call us to, really doesn't work without radical apathy. Uh, people are not, it's at least very difficult for most people to be genuinely tolerant of things on which they have very strong convictions. When they say that they want to tolerate a wide variety of lifestyles, it's because they don't actually have any strong conviction about there being a right or wrong lifestyle. In this respect, we're living in a society a lot like that of the later Roman Empire, which was radically polytheistic. Every, any, there were, anybody could worship whatever god or mystery cult they wanted to. 
And it was for that very reason, uh, it couldn't tolerate the monotheist Christians. So you had religious freedom, relatively speaking, within the Roman Empire. And the fact that the Christians actually believed something, believed that there was one God and all the others were false, made them intolerable. And we see this same trend, I think, in society today, where radical tolerance, supposed tolerance, doesn't know what to do with people who actually have strong convictions on the things that society wants to tolerate. So I think it's worth observing that this dilemma, should we get along, is harder for us as Christians, perhaps, than anyone else. Because for us, our commitment to absolute truth should be stronger than it is for our fellow citizens. We really believe that there is an objective truth of things. There is a right and a wrong, which is worth sometimes division and conflict. On the other hand, our calling to reconciliation is also greater than anyone else. As Christians, we are indeed called to uh, imitate with one another the peace that Christ has established. So we are pulled in both directions, and there are many in the church who want to sound just one of these themes or the other, to emphasize the need to stake out hard lines of truth or the need to bring reconciliation and peace. And our calling is to live within this tension, not fearing or being phased by conflict, but also never resting content with it or letting it become self-justifying. Now, um, with that, all that kind of introductory material, I want to turn to Richard Hooker, who I want to use tonight to help us think about three sources of our conflicts, pride, prejudice, and precisionism. Now, who is Richard Hooker? Well, if you want a proper answer to that, uh, you have to see some of the things I've written or that we've, we've put out at the Davenant Institute. But very briefly, Richard Hooker is an Anglican, or you could say English Reformed theologian writing in the um, closing decade of the 16th century, so about 50 years after the English Reformation. Now, this is a period in which society has seen radical upheaval and transformation. They are dealing with some of the sources of insecurity that I've talked about. The, the, for the, you've had centuries of traditional society in which things were kind of always done a certain way and everyone, everyone did it that way. And now there's religious conflict, there's religious diversity, there's the awareness of different options, which can create this great insecurity that leads to conflict. Um, also, at the time Hooker's writing, there's a real fear of foreign invasion and assassination. England at this time faced frequent assassination plots on Queen Elizabeth by Catholic uh, spies, often agents of the King of Spain. So the King of Spain is both a religious foe representing the forces of Catholicism determined to reestablish obedience to the Pope, and he's also a sort of traditional geopolitical foe who wants, who sees England as a rival to be crushed. Of course, the defeat of the Spanish Armada is in 1588, and that settles things down a bit, but you've had really intense period of uh, religious and political anxiety leading up to that. And indeed, the war with Spain is going on for the entire time that Hooker is writing uh, in the 1580s and 1590s. You also have, as we do today, new media of communication that are acting as accelerants for conflict. Whereas we now are dealing with the internet and how on earth do we deal with this new communication tool which speeds up conversation so much and can uh, cause debates to spiral out of control before we know how to resolve them, can easily spread misinformation. Similarly, in their time, they are dealing with the printing press for the first time, which seems very slow to us but for them was experienced in the same way as something that radically accelerated the pace of controversy and uh, the ease with which misinformation could spread. So um, Richard Hooker is writing in, he writes his, uh, his magnum opus is the laws of ecclesiastical polity, which is defense of the Protestant church of England against uh, the Puritans who wanted to reform it further. And I almost try not to use the word Puritan in this context, because there's many people who, see the, who have very good associations with the term Puritan, and many of those associations are with Puritans who are not really who Hooker's dealing with, not who he's critiquing. Um, 
and I, in fact, I prefer to use the term, as I'll use later, precisionist. In any case, though, Hooker's concern is not so much with the particular reforms they're suggesting, which he often grants are reasonable enough reforms, but the basis on which they're putting these reforms forward as the only biblical way to order a church. And he sees that as very dangerous and likely to um, intensify conflict rather than resolve it. All right. So with all of that, let's turn to the first source of conflict I want to address, the issue of pride. Now, this might seem an almost banal point to make, uh, to say that pride is the source of our conflicts, but surely it is. Surely the most pervasive source of conflict is our human propensity to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And when it comes to conflicts of ideas, we naturally think too highly of those ideas that we ourselves hold or that we ourselves, especially, that we ourselves have come up with. Here's what uh, Hooker says in his learned, learned sermon on the nature of pride. Oh, just a, a quick note. All my quotations from Hooker, except this one, um, are going to be from our modernization of Richard Hooker's laws. So they're going to sound like a little bit more modern English than Hooker himself wrote in, just for ease of comprehension. Uh, so he says in his sermon on the nature of pride, there is in the heart of every proud man first an error of understanding, a vain opinion whereby he thinketh his own excellency and by reason whereof his worthiness of estimation, regard, and honor to be greater than in truth it is. This maketh him in all his affections accordingly to raise up himself, and by his inward affections his outward acts are fashioned. So, you know, Hooker says the first error of the proud man is an error of understanding, right? It is, he has... He has wrong ideas about his own ideas. He has a wrong evalu evaluation of the epistemic status, we could say, of his beliefs and convictions. He tend, he, the proud man naturally thinks he knows that he's wrong sometimes, right? But it's that, you know, it's that, that uh, joke, or, which is, you know, actual statistic, you know, that like, you know, 80% of people consider themselves to be above average drivers, right? You know, and this is, this is true. Most of us, we know there's a sliding scale. We, know, we usually know we're not the awesomest, but most of us think of ourselves as above average. And, we, and most of us think of our ideas as, you know, we, we assume, we, we think that we're right about most things. I mean, if we didn't think we were right, we, we wouldn't hold those views, right? So um, we then become attached to our ideas in this emotional way that is disproportionate, perhaps, to their actual... Uh, epistemic status. Now, um, then H Hooker says at one point, talking about Calvin, he says, but wise men are only human, and the truth is the truth. What John Calvin did to establish his church discipline seems better than what he taught about it after it had been established. We all tend to fall in love with our own ideas, and when others contradict them, this only fans our love into a flame and makes us all the more eager to contend, argue, and do everything we can on their behalf. So this is a very shrewd observation, right? Which is that, uh, that, that predisposition in favor of our own ideas is, is bad enough to begin with, but the worst thing about it is that controversy, conflict, disagreement, which perhaps ought, rationally speaking, perhaps to reduce our confidence in our ideas. We encounter somebody who disagrees, they push back, maybe we should reconsider. But very few of us do that. On the contrary, we often come away from a conflict more attached to our ideas than we came into it with. And this is, in, you know, this is in fact, again, something that um, you know, modern research psychologists have confirmed. And they'll actually tell you, if you, if, you know, if you want to win an argument with someone, don't directly contradict them. Find a way to sort of, you know, do this sort of backhanded intellectual jujitsu or this sort of inception where you, you, get, you get their ideas, your ideas into their head and they don't realize that you're contradicting them. Because if somebody feels contradicted, they, they dig in, right? And they, 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 they fall, it fans their love into a flame. It makes them more eager to contend, argue, and do everything they can on their behalf. Now, it's important to note 
that pride in this context, in fact, in all contexts, but particularly in this context, is not just a matter of personal pride. When we hear pride, we tend to think of you know, individual arrogance, right? But much more common really is group pride or, or tribal loyalty. Yeah, sorry, my microphone was plunged there. Very good. Um, so we tend to, we identify with a group that we're part of, a church that we belong to, a denomination, a political affiliation. Very often it's, it's a particular leader or figure that we sort of, um, we, you know, we don't claim to be an expert, but we sort of attach ourselves to somebody that we, um, we kind of live vicariously through their expertise. We, they become our guru. And if somebody attacks them, then that really gets our hackles up, right? So, and this is a form of pride. It can look like humility. Oh, I don't know that much. I'm, I'm just, look, I'm just following this guy here, right? But you're, it's, a, it's a form of, a, can be a form of intense pride in the group that we belong to or, or, or a vicarious pride in our leader. Now, Hooker observed this problem in the Church of England, in fact, in, throughout many Reformed churches in the later uh, 1500s. He had great respect for Calvin, but he said, two things there are which great, trouble greatly these later times. One, that the Church of Rome cannot, and another, that Geneva will not err. Right? The belief that Geneva will not err. And he says about Calvin, his work casts such a long shadow over everyone else that if someone contradicts him, they are looked upon with suspicion. And if they agree, he still gets all the credit for saying it first. In those works published after the dispute about Presbyterian discipline had begun, he never passes by an opportunity to praise his form of church government and to insist that it is necessary. What Peter Lombard was to the Roman Catholic Church, so Calvin was to the preachers of Reformed churches. And they came to think that the most learned divines were those best versed in Calvin's writings. His books were the standard against which to measure anything having to do with doctrine or discipline. So people <clears throat> attach themselves to a particular leader and have, take pride in that leader. And then they begin to use that person as a uh, a measuring rod against which every other claim is to be assessed, right? Who are the most learned theologians? Well, the most learned theologians are obviously the ones who seem to quote my guy the most, who agree with my guy the most, right? And we, we wouldn't usually, we very rarely say it to ourselves. We do do that subconsciously all the time in politics and in theology, where having, which I mean, just makes sense, right? Problems are complicated. Problems are very complicated and, and complex, and there's all kinds of issues to consider. It's much easier to simplify them by focusing on a people. And so if there's a person that we trust, that's how God designed us. He designed us to trust people, but we can become fixated on a particular person that we trust. And then we use that person to adjudicate all other claims. If, if somebody if somebody critiques, critiques that person, oh, well, now I know I can disregard them, right? Or somebody compliments that person, okay, now I know that that person themselves is trustworthy. Now, um, pride can take the form of either of overrating our own ability or the ability of our community or our leader, or importantly, underrating the difficulty or complexity of a problem. I think it's really important to think on this because um, it's very easy for pride to hide under false humility. I think you see this a lot in the American church today and in the American right, uh, which have always harbored a kind of anti-intellectual streak. In these circles, there can be a kind of valorization of plain old common sense, right? This whole, I'm only, I'm only a simple man, right? You know, I, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not an academic. You know, people just say, I'm only a simple person. And so I just, I look at things kind of black and white. And... This is sometimes exactly what's needed. Sometimes um, it is the, the, you know, the, the, the simple folk who just trust Jesus and don't get caught up in all of the academic distinctions that keep the church faithful. But sometimes this plea for simplicity is really perversely a kind of pride. It's, it's the pride, it takes pride in its own simplicity and it says, this is actually a simple problem that simple people like me can see right through. And it's only you overeducated people that have made it needlessly complicated. Now, Hooker addressed this with the Puritans as well. 
So he's dealing with, he's, uh, he's anticipating this objection that they, they why they shouldn't um, listen to their church leaders who are telling them that this is a very, something's a very complicated issue, right? He says, you might reply that if the people's guides are blind, the rest must certainly not close their eyes and be led by them. If the priest has shown partiality in the law, then the flock must not depart from the way of sincere truth and naively follow him merely because he has authority. Now, this is true, but not a good defense in this case, because however convinced you may be that you are in the right, this matter is far more complicated than one in 500 of you can imagine. The uneducated among you should be aware that even the least of the changes you are so set on involves all sorts of debated issues that you have no conception of. I do not say this to deride those who are ignorant, but I genuinely want them to realize that this matter in which they are so doggedly convinced is extremely complex and that they run the risk of falling under the condemnation of the apostle who describes those who rail at whatsoever things they know not. And then he talks about elsewhere, what is the danger of this false simplicity of this, of this conviction that it, it's all really simple, it's all really black and white, and any faithful Christian should be able to understand it. He says, once this notion is planted in the minds of the common folk, God only knows where it may end. Thus far, we see it has already made thousands so headstrong and blatant errors that a man who can scarcely utter five words in a rational manner is not ashamed to think that in matters of scripture, his own private opinion trumps all the wise and sober judgments within the whole world. Such insolence must be restrained or it will be the bane of the Christian religion. All right, so much for pride. Now, what about prejudice? Now, as I've just mentioned, pride is more often a matter of group identity than of purely individual arrogance. And this is certainly true of its flip side, prejudice. Prejudice is almost by definition directed against groups, classes, or tribes of people. It's, we, we, don't, we don't really have prejudice against an individual, uh, except in as much as we see that individual as a, as a member of some group that we have a prejudice against. And prejudice can be deeply, deeply rooted and hard to uproot. Now, prejudice, as the word itself suggests, involves a triumph of passions over reason. Instead of judging an issue rationally, we prejudge it based on our emotional responses. These emotions often take shape as the mirror image of our positive emotions. Because we love some, some one or some, some group, we then look askance at all who are opposed to them. I already mentioned this phenomenon uh, as, as Hooker, right? He talks about Calvin. His work casts such a long shadow over everyone else that if someone contradicts him, they are looked upon with suspicion, right? If someone contradicts him, they are looked upon with suspicion. So we start off with um, often a well-directed love towards some individual cause, group, ideal. And then anyone that we perceive as contrary to it or as undermining it, we then develop an emotional uh, Dis, distaste for them at the very least, which can, which in turn into downright hatred. Now, what is the effect of this? Well, this can, this can, this quickly can take over and sort of short circuit our rational processes. So Hooker says, every new reformed church that came along aspired to remove itself even further from any hint of the church of Rome than the churches before it had. Thus they drifted further and further apart from one another in practice. And as a result, there came to be much strife, jealousy, discord, and bad blood between them. This is really a wonderful insight. We see this so often in the church, saw it at the time of the Reformation, where we know that Rome is bad. Okay, we know that much. And so that must mean that any church that is kind of like Rome is also bad. And therefore, I'm going to distance myself from that church too, because it's, it's just, it's not far enough away from Rome. And then someone else comes along and says, well, look, here's how the way in which your church is still, I don't know, still seems a little too friendly, has these Romish elements. So I'm going to distance myself from that too. And so we, we keep trying to purify ourselves more and more in opposition to this thing that we fear and hate. I think you can see this sometimes taking hold in, um, the way some churches deal with issues like um, same-sex attraction, right? 
where, well, we know that any church that affirms, that affirms homosexuality is bad. Okay, fine. Well, then what about people who simply don't denounce homosexuality enough? Well, they must be bad too. Well, what about people who don't denounce the people who don't denounce, right? And, I, and I've seen this with, with friends who were, they themselves were very orthodox, but they just weren't as combative as other people were. And therefore they were perceived as being soft on the issue or being soft, at least being soft on people who were being soft on the issue, right? And so then this prejudice takes hold and we begin to, um, we ostracize whole groups of people simply on the basis that they are uh, too close to this thing that we, this, th this real evil that we want to distance ourselves from. Now, once the passions start driving the bus instead of reason, debate becomes increasingly difficult. As Hooker says, when men's passions instead of their reason lead them to believe things, they are often even more zealous than usual in defending their error than they have a right to be, given the evidence we find in scripture, right? That we actually, we, we, we tend to argue most fiercely about those things that we have an emotional attachment to, not those things that we have a, a well-established rational conviction. But then Hooker says, it is not how passionately someone is convinced, but how soundly they argue that should persuade us that their views generally come from the Holy Spirit and not from the deceit of that evil spirit. So what he's warning us here is that people argue most strongly for those things that they have the strongest emotional attachment to. And onlookers can often say, oh, well, that person's really passionate. Like we use that word passionate now as a good thing. We wouldn't necessarily have used it as a good thing back then. We see passionate as a good thing. Somebody they're really arguing strongly for something. Well, that seems to be proof that, that there's something to their position. And particularly in the church, right? That person is zealous for righteousness. That person is really upset about injustice or really, um, firm against evil or against compromise. And the, the righteous anger that that person shows, people look at it and they say, well, that is a sign that that person is on the Lord's side. I want to be with them. Um, whereas Hooker says, right, it's not how passionately someone is convinced, but how soundly they argue that should persuade us that their views genuinely come from the Holy Spirit and not from the deceit of that evil spirit. Now, um, to some measure, all of this is unavoidable. It's mere human nature. But we can choose whether or not to stoke the fires of this passion or not. And quite often, we do choose to stoke them. We actually look for ways to work ourselves up into a deeper prejudice or a stronger passion. Hooker's account of this perverse but all too familiar process is worth quoting at length. So again, he's, he's talking here in the context of, of people who have, who have this righteous zeal for certain beliefs in this context, a certain righteous zeal for trying to distance the church as much as possible from the church of Rome. And uh, what he says is their, their godly leaders go on though to persuade those ready to believe such things that they alone see these things in scripture because of the special illumination of the Holy Spirit, even though others who read scripture cannot find such things. So the, the, the idea comes about that the reason, the reason for this conflict, the reason they believe this and other people don't, the reason they understand it is because they have some kind of special gift of the Spirit, some special revelation, some special access to the truth of scripture. And and the implication is that other people who don't, no, as what's funny is actually if you, if you put it that way, then it would seem that should get rid of pride, right? I mean, if, if the Spirit has given me some extra grace and I see something that other people don't, I should humbly be grateful that the Spirit has given me that extra insight and I should have pity on those who don't. But in fact, we are very, very capable of taking pride in things that we attribute to the Spirit. It's very strange, right? So the Spirit has given me this extra insight that makes me pretty awesome. The spirit hasn't given it to those people. Well, that makes them pretty wicked, right? So um, we, we then, anyone who hasn't got the special insight that we have, it's because of their wickedness. And of course, this, this claim to special insight, there's secular forms of this. We see this in the 
the woke movement. I mean, the whole metaphor of being woke, you've woken up, you've seen reality, you understand injustice, you see where racism is and racism is everywhere, right? And other people might not see it, you know, oh, you, you, don't, you don't see the pervasiveness of racism. Well, that, that's just because you haven't, you don't, you don't, haven't gotten it yet. You don't get it. You haven't seen, uh, the, the, you don't understand the theory, right? So um, this claim to special insight is, is everywhere. Now, what Hooker says is after the common people are thoroughly convinced the spirit has persuaded them of these things, <clears throat> then they learn that believing in this form of church government is a sign of being born of God and that earnest love for this discipline is the surest way to distinguish God's people from all others. This has caused them to use terms that sharply distinguish between themselves and the rest of the world. They call themselves the brethren, the godly, and so forth. While the rest are termed worldlings, time servers, pleasers of men, not of God, and so forth. Because of this, such people are led to believe, listen to this, this is key. They are led to believe that they must do everything they can to strengthen one another and make themselves manifest to the world, lest they quench the spirit. This makes them especially eager to listen to whoever is of their party, to take every opportunity to have secret meetings with them, to be directed and counseled by them in all important matters. Now, what Hooker is talking about here is the phenomenon of the echo chamber, as we call it now, right? The idea of surrounding yourself only with people who already more or less believe what you believe. Now, why would you do this? Well, the reason you would do this is because once you become convinced that there's a, it's a matter of godliness and wickedness. Um, oh, so someone is just, sorry, someone just commented, they were, it'd be great if they had page numbers, I get page numbers for these in case you're following along with Hooker, which is great that someone's doing that, sorry. Um, I didn't actually put the page numbers in my sheet, but I do have, this is from the preface section, the chapter three, section 11, if you want to look, great, great passage. So, um, Anyway, if you're convinced that it's a matter of godliness versus wickedness, then why would you want to expose yourself to the false views of the ungodly? Why would you want to, to, to weaken your faith by putting it in conflict with this falsehood? No, you need to surround yourself with those people who get it, those people who already understand and they're on the side of, of justice or on the side of righteousness, right? And again, we see this in secular political movements too. We huddle together with those who already get it because what would be the point? Since we get it, what would be the point of being around others except possibly to quench the spirit? Right? Now, what's going on in the situation, right? What's going on is quite unsettling. It's not enough for us to think that we're right. We have to know that we're right. So this means attributing our knowledge to some kind of special revelation or unique insight, or what often amounts to the same thing, some kind of moral superiority. We get it and they don't because we're good and they're wicked because we're smart and they're dumb. So this is stage one. Stage two is to say, well, if they're wicked, why would we want to spend time around them? Why would we want to be infected by their lies? And so we shut up our ears against dissent, dismissing it in advance. Now, stage three is to surround ourselves with those who already agree with us. At this point, our reason, which we may have suppressed till now, is allowed to reactivate. Now we can turn our brains back on, but with very limited functionality. We listen to the arguments and we digest them, thinking that they offer support for our, for our prejudged views, right? We, we listen to all the sermon tapes, we listen to all the political speeches, but since we've ensured that we're only hearing from those we already agree with, this isn't very meaningful. But we gain greater certainty, which is what we craved all along, not knowledge. It's certainty we're after, not knowledge. So this brings us to our last point, precisionism. Now this term precisionism uh, was actually the, the most common early term of abuse used for what were later called Puritans. They were precisionists. They were very precise about everything. They were very, uh, they were very strict and they, had, they were very strict and precise in their interpretation of the scriptures because they were after certainty. Now, everyone is after certainty, okay? This is, this is human nature. Hooker says, the mind of man always desires to know the truth with as much certainty as the nature of the subject permits. 
Everybody does. This is a normal human condition. And indeed, it's vastly heightened during times of social dislocation or moral uncertainty. All right, we all want, we all want a clear conscience. Nobody, nobody likes the experience of having uh, an uneasy conscience or, or, or wondering whether they've done something wrong or not. And it's a lot easier to have a clear conscience when you're embedded in a community that has clearly defined expectations of right and wrong. It, you know, it, it can feel a little bit oppressive, but at least if everybody kind of agrees this is right, this is wrong, you kind of know what the rules are. If you at least seem to be following the rules, you can have a clear conscience. Or if you're a total rebel and you just kind of throw off all restraints and you deny the, the, that there are fixed moral norms and you just do your own thing, well, then you can perhaps have a clear conscience because you've seared your conscience. The hardest position of all is the one that Christians today find themselves in. We still care about right and wrong, but we no longer live in surroundings of clearly defined goods and values. We are all of us living with profound uncertainty. We are each of us racked with an existential anxiety, to use my friend Joe's favorite word. I hope he's watching. So how, how do we deal with this anxiety, this deep, uh, deep crisis of conscience, crisis of certainty? Well, what we tend to do is we tend to seek out some standard that will provide us absolute certainty, that promises absolute certainty. Now, for Christians, this is scripture, although many movements in the modern world have their own creeds and Bibles, right? The, uh, what really it is, is we're looking for a, a universal answer manual, the, the master theory that you plug in any problem, any situation, and it will tell you what is going on, and it will tell you what you need to do about it, All right? For some people, this is QAnon. For some people, this is critical race theory, right? Now, is this what scripture is supposed to be? Is, this, is scripture supposed to be a universal answer manual? Well, I would suggest not. And the problem is that by insisting that it is, we can actually intensify our problem of certainty. All right, consider this, right? You start off with a crisis of un uncertainty and someone tells you, oh, well, read this book. This book will tell you your ans the, the answer. This book will tell you how you're supposed to please God. This book will tell you what it, you know, um, you can you can have a politics according to the Bible to use a title of a, uh, uh, an evangelical, the big evangelical book about 10 years ago, right? This, this book will give you the certainty that you need for, all, for your problems. Now, the gap that you have, you actually start reading it and start trying to apply it to the problems around you. You find it's not doing the trick. It's not answering the questions. It's not providing certainty. And the gap between the expected certainty and the experienced certainty becomes yawningly wide. Again, Hooker's diagnosis here is remarkably sharp. He says, I write all this particularly because I see how a great many souls, and this is book two, chapter seven, section five, and if you're following along at home, I see how a great many souls are misinformed on this point and therefore often greatly distressed. When bare and unfounded conclusions are put into their minds and they find that they do not have the expected certainty, they imagine that this proceeds from a lack of faith and that the spirit of God does not work in them as it does in true believers. By this, their hearts are much troubled and they fall into anguish and confusion. But the fact is that no matter how bold and confident we may be in words, when it comes down to it, then however strong the evidence for the truth is, so strong is our heart's assent. And it cannot be stronger if properly grounded. So you cannot will yourself into being more certain about something if the matter itself if the evidence does not provide that certainty, if, if scripture doesn't really answer that question. Now, this is the danger of the weak conscience, the weak conscience that really wants that certainty and, and recognizes it's not getting it and then has a crisis of conscience. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me that I don't have enough faith? But there's another danger just as great. Some have falsely strong consciences, right? Some manage to imagine that their universal answer manual really has given them all the answers. They thus achieve the nirvana of certainty, but the cost of disconnection from reality. The result, here's what Hooker says, preface chapter eight. 
In these sorts of errors, once the mind imagines itself to be executing God's will, it immediately removes anything or anyone that stands in its way. And if anything strange or new seems to be necessary, some strange new argument proving its lawfulness is introduced under the name of divine authority. And then he says later on, um, or no, just, just a couple pages later on, my purpose is to show that when the minds of men are once erroneously persuaded that it is the will of God for them to do those things they fancy, their opinions are as thorns in their sides, not allowing them to rest until they have put their speculations into practice. Their restless desire to remove anything in their way leads them by the hand into increasingly dangerous opinions, sometimes quite contrary to their original intentions. Whenever people hide their own errors under the cloak of divine authority, it is impossible for anyone to imagine what will come of it until time has revealed the fruits. Therefore, it is only wisdom to fear what may come of it, even beyond any apparent cause for fear. Now, this is really startlingly timely. Um, I think we can all draw our own applications, but I think we, we can't help but think about the events of last month. And I think probably, you know, the several hundred people currently being tried for their role in the cap Capitol riots, probably if you had asked most of those people a year ago or two years ago, could you see yourself uh, violently assaulting the U.S. Capitol and trying to hunt down Congress people and threaten them with death or whatever, they'd probably be like, no, it's like crazy. I would never do Like I have some strong political opinions, but you know, no, I'd never do that, right? Uh, but many of these people did in fact hide their errors under the cloak of divine authority. I mean, it's, it's, it's striking, it's disturbing. If you look at some of the, the videos of the, the intensely religious rhetoric behind some of this. And what Hooker's diagnosing here is the, the mentality of the conspiracy theory, right? That you've, um, you have special insight into reality and you're on the side of righteousness, right? You, are, you, you see what's going on and you alone are committed to, to doing the will of God, to, to putting things right, to, to, to bringing about justice. And once you hide your errors under the cloak of divine authority, there's no telling where that's going to go. You just go deeper and deeper down that rabbit hole and you end up, he says, um, into increasingly dangerous opinions, sometimes quite contrary to their original intentions. You might end up calling for things that seem the precise opposite of what you started out calling for. So um, it is only wisdom to fear what may come of it, even beyond any apparent cause for fear. The, the, this, this danger starts small in the beginning, but it can yield, um, it can end in a very, very evil place. So how do we get out of this situation? Well, I'm pretty much out of time. Um, so, but thankfully my lecture wasn't entitled, um, what do we do about conflict? How do we get along? It was entitled, why can't we get along? Uh, so I'm not really going to try to answer that question tonight. I did, I do have a lecture in the series that I did for Chapel of the Cross. And these are, um, where can you, uh, I think, Presumably, I think Chapel of the Cross Facebook page, you could find them, at the very least. Um, anyway, where I uh, addressed this question of, of how can we get along? Well, let me just say a couple things briefly. So one of the keys is good hermeneutics. Good hermeneutics, good tools of interpretation of scripture. And this is something that Hooker devoted a huge amount of attention to. Because the problem is that there really are some things about which the Christian really is supposed to be certain there are things on which scripture is sufficient and perspicuous. These were key Protestant doctrines, the sufficiency of scripture. Scripture is all you need. Pers perspicuity of scripture. Scripture is clear and easy to understand. But the reformers were very careful to qual qualify those. Scripture is sufficient for salvation. Scripture is perspicuous on what you need to be saved. And they recognized that uh, scripture that not that the, the core gospel message of scripture should be clear and is something that we should have certainty about. We should have by the spirit, we have this assurance. We have this um, certainty of the grace of God that goes beyond what any mere reason could provide. So this idea that of a certainty that goes beyond reason, a certainty that seems irrational perhaps is 
not in itself an unbiblical or unchristian idea. But um, the, the reformers did not think that that level of certainty was something that was supposed to be sought or expected in all matters. That we should be expecting this special sort of the, the spirit to give us this special gift of grace of certainty that uh, went beyond what our senses alone could, could give us. There are many matters, therefore, on which scripture is not sufficient and perspicuous, either because it simply doesn't speak to the subject. There's a lot of things the Bible just doesn't talk about, right? Um, but also there's things that it talks about in a way that is frankly obscure and is open to debate, right? And uh, the reformers acknowledged this and they tried to distinguish between those things on which the Christian should seek certainty and those things on which the Christian should um, be open to disagreement in which Christians will disagree because uh, scripture doesn't resolve the question. And Hooker, I think, offers a really uh, useful toolkit for, starting, for sorting through that and figuring out when should we expect certainty? When should we draw hard lines, and hard lines in the sand? And when shouldn't we? I think the fact is that many Christians today walk around feeling highly confident in being downright certain about matters on which I think no one who's really engaging reality in an open-eyed way could possibly be certain, okay? I don't think that any, I'm just gonna stick my head on the air, I don't think that any really serious, thoughtful person should be certain about, say, what healthcare policy should be. You might have strong views, but that's a complicated issue. Tax policy, immigration, what to do with Confederate statues, all right, anyone who's certain about the answers to these questions, I think, uh, is not really paying attention. Even the meaning of Genesis 1, I think, is a matter on which Christians can have strong views. But if you think you're certain about that, and everybody else is just out to lunch, then I think you need to reconsider your hermeneutic. Now, um, what Hooker says in this, and I know I really, I really need to wrap up here, but um, Hooker says there's this he observes this problem where we try to force scripture to answer questions that it doesn't actually answer. And here's what he says about this. Why do they presumptuously and superfluously attempt to prove that God should have done it, should have answered this question in scripture, when the real question that matters is whether he has in fact done it? If there is no such thing recorded, it is as if someone were to demand an inheritance on the grounds of a written will, and when the will contains no mention of this, to go on to argue from the love or favor which the maker of the will had for him, imagining that such pleas will cause the will to contain what other men cannot find in it. When it comes to the deeds of God, our duty is merely to search out what he has done and to admire it with meekness, rather than to argue about what our reason dictates God should have done. And I will close with a final quote from Hooker about if the number, if the starting point of our conflicts is pride, then the starting point of their reconciliation is humility. Your best and safest course of action, dear brethren, he says, is to reconsider your previous actions and to reevaluate the cause you've taken in hand, to examine it point by point and argument by argument with all the diligent precision you can muster, putting aside the gall of bitterness which has filled your minds and searching out the truth with humility. Consider that you are but men and that it is not impossible for you to err. Impartially sift your hearts and see whether your opinions have been fed by force of argument or unchecked passion. If truth is anywhere manifest, do not smother her with flattering delusions, but acknowledge her greatness and think it your best victory even when she triumphs over you. It will be no discredit or blemish for you to go back on what you once so earnestly advocated. Among all the numerous works of St. Augustine, it is not the book in which he compiles his mistakes and condemns them, the one that has gotten him the greatest love, commendation, and honor. Job demonstrates his wisdom and other virtues in many speeches, but he nowhere better displays the glory of a noble mind than in these words, what shall I answer thee? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once have I spoken and I will not answer, yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, we will take just a hand, a few minutes for you to um, post your questions in the Q&A box, preferably not the chat box. And um, 
get a drink or I'm going to get a drink and, and then um, we'll come back in five minutes. All right, I'm back. Michael, do you want to moderate this point? Sure. So at this point, we've received a couple requests for uh, where people can find that set of lectures that you spoke of in Dallas. So would you yeah. mind telling people? That's, um, let me, why don't I just double check that? Okay. And I, I will say this. Um, but I know they were on Facebook, so. Okay. Um, so this lecture will be recorded and put on YouTube and we will post a link to those lectures in the description. That's a very good idea. Of that. that YouTube. Um, so that's, that's where you can find them. Stay tuned for this YouTube link and then. So in the meantime, moving on to some other questions, uh, Scott asks, could you distinguish between certainty and assurance? Is it in their foundations or their objects? Sorry, say the second part. Uh, is, is the distinction between certainty and assurance in their foundation or their objects? Yes. Um, I like that. I like that. Um, yeah, so, uh, well, my, my first thought is, is the term assurance is most often used. Um, so let me just to sort of talk around this and maybe I'll be getting at what the question is getting at. Um, assurance is used in the context of assurance of salvation. That the thing I was saying, you know, toward the end, there are things that we are supposed to be certain about. Um, and, and the reformers spoke us particularly of, we are supposed to have an assurance of salvation, but even there um, that it would be, it's at least, potentially misleading to speak of a certainty of salvation because that then starts to shift the focus 
And, and, and I think in the way that the questioner asks, um, you know, the, the, what is the foundation versus the object, which is say, why do we have, why can we have an assurance of salvation? Well, because we're not focusing on the object ourselves, um, but we're focusing on the foundation, which is Christ and his work in us. And what you know, the reformers will say is, you know, that you, if your assurance begins to waver, they use the metaphor, you know, just as um, Peter walking on the water, right? When he, he's, when he's looking at Christ and believes in Christ, he's able to walk on the water. And when he stops and looks down at the water and looks at himself, he starts to sink. Just so the believer whose gaze is focused on Christ can indeed have assurance of Christ's love, Christ's salvation, Christ's work within him. But when he starts to sort of think about himself as the object of that and analyze, oh, is my, do I have enough faith? Am I really, am I really faithing enough? Right. Then uh, it becomes self-defeating and the, and the, the, the certainty disappears. <laughs> so that's certainly where in, in that context, I would make that kind of distinction um, more generally using those terms, certainty and assurance. Um, I think we could, I think we could say something, sort of similar, um, in fact, I think we, we should, in terms of um, what I'm saying could sound like the Christian is supposed to just be this kind of like uneasy skeptic all the time and like you never just always sort of doubting, am I doing the right thing because, well, because I know I can't be certain of it. I've, been, I've just been telling you all the reasons that you, you shouldn't have a false certainty. These things are complicated. So how do you know if you're doing the right thing? Maybe you're not supposed to know if you're doing the right thing. And, um, you know, what Luther says, and this is that, I'm, I'm not going to have a quote just right anymore, I'm trying to think, but, um, but, but basically, Luther's point is uh, the Christian who is um, acting out of faith, who is, who is uh, trusting their identity is secure in Christ. They know that they're imperfect. They know that they're fallible. Uh, but they know that Christ is bearing them up and they are seeking to do his will, then they can have an assurance that God is pleased with their actions, even when they might mess up, right? Even you make mistakes, make wrong decisions, come down the wrong side of something. You can nonetheless have an assurance, a peace of soul, a peace of conscience about your action, even in matters that are uh, uncertain. And I think often what we do is we try to replace, and again, I haven't actually described it this way in these terms, although I, I, argue, I do something kind of similar in my dissertation. Um, but we replace assurance, which is that uh, deep-seated existential confidence that comes from resting on Christ. We try to replace that assurance with certainty, which is this kind of objectively verifiable um, you know, uh, where we, we know that we are right and that we're and that other people are wrong. You're muted. Okay. So John asks, if scripture is not a universal answer manual, can we know anything with any certainty? Um. Yes, absolutely. And this is, um, I mean, again, well, let's we start, let's start at the, at the, at the, the basics. Um, you know, I don't think we need to be Cartesian skeptics in the sense of uh, doubting, like, this is, the, the reformers are working before, and I think we should, we should follow them back to before. Um, Descartes, who comes along and says, well, can I really know, I don't know, do I really know there's a microphone? here before me? Am I really talking? Is this all just a dream? Am I just having a, a nightmare that I'm having to give this lecture, right? Um, the God gave us our senses. God gave us the world to inhabit and intended us for to be able to gain knowledge of the world immediately and intuitively at a basic level, right? And then um, through rational reflection and demonstration, and then through 
testimony. I mean, Hooker has this great part in the, he, Hooker basically addresses this very question. Basically like, well, wait a minute, hang on. If, uh, you know, can we be, why can we trust, can we trust any kind of, what, what basically if we can't trust scripture, what can we trust? Cause scripture must be the most trustworthy thing of all. And, and, and what could any other source of knowledge give us? And he kind of goes through, and he's like, look, like here are things that you know. Um, and you, in fact, you know them just based on fallible human authorities. Like the, you know, that there was someone named Julius Caesar. Does anyone here doubt that there once was a man named Julius Caesar? Well, no. Um, like that, you could kind of try to work, find some way of working yourself up into some doubt, but really that's a sort of historical fact that's beyond doubt. And that's something that happened 2000 years ago. That not only have you not seen, but nobody that you know has seen it, right? It's, it's simply a matter of testimony from these, from these old historical documents. How much more so can I know that you know, there's a, not, not at the moment, but you know, um, actually not for quite some time. I was going to say there's a school bus driving down the street. That hasn't happened uh, since, you know, about a year ago, I suppose. Um, but there are objects of the world that we can know, and we can know with confidence uh, what comes from human testimony about those things. Um, and even now, once, of course, we get into sort of moral questions, that's where it becomes more complicated. Can we have moral certainty um, outside of, well, can we have moral certainty from anything, right? And um, I would say, again, the Protestant tradition has followed the small c Catholic tradition and saying there is natural law, that God's law is written on the heart. Our moral intuitions are written on our hearts and there is an, a grasp of good and evil that is available to us. Now, when we go beyond that to particular, this particular thing good or this particular thing evil, this is where we do have to rest often on scripture and trust in the, that, that what God says in scripture is he, he gives us through the spirit, this assurance uh, that he is true, that his word is true. And that through that, those things that scripture does indeed speak to, which it doesn't speak to all the things we might want it to, but there are plenty of things that it does in fact speak to that it can give us a source of, certainty or at least relative certainty right this is part of the big part of Hooker's point is that we it's not like an either or it's not a black and white it's not like we either have certainty or we know nothing right there are many 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 things most things in life we are, are somewhere on the very prop we are we're in the spectrum of the probable and we're and we're happy with that we're generally you know like i don't i don't know that i'm going to be able to drive to church because you know the the road could suddenly be shut down by a massive accident, but it's not, I don't say, well, there's no point in even trying because I don't know that I can get there today. Right. Um, so just so in many of the, the doctrinal things that we struggle with, um, there can be room for uncertainty in matters of debatable of Christian doctrine and practice. And yet that doesn't mean that we can't arrive at some, fairly strong probable conviction of what is likely the truest interpretation of what God has told us through scripture and nature. So Mark asks, the reformed and evangelical world seems divided between cultural transformationists and the two kingdoms view. How would Hooker's views help us with this conflict in the church, which seems to have led to tribalism? Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if I would uh, necessarily, I'm, I mean, I don't know if I would say that the evangelical church is divided just into those two camps, depending on how one categorizes it. Um, I'd say many perhaps don't even have anything quite as coherent as either of those. Um, I, to this, I, w I actually have a piece on the two kingdoms, um, I've written quite a bit on this topic and with relation to Hooker, but um, I've, I've just written something for the Gospel Coalition Canada, which will be coming out on Monday, kind of an introduction to reformational two kingdoms thinking, which is, um, I argue, not the kind of two kingdoms thinking that is often used in the church today. Um, so, for the interest of time, I'll just direct you to that. Be on the lookout for that piece of the Gospel Coalition. And that will also link to a book that the Davenant Institute has published, 
where I've written on that topic. And I do quote Hooker a fair bit and that it's just a little concise book. Uh, so that's probably get a better answer there than anything I could, or I could use up the rest of our time, but um, having already written on it, I will defer to that. Uh, Mason asks, you talked about how tolerance on a contentious issue is often due to apathy about the issue in question. How do we distinguish between being comfortable with uncertainty from being apathetic about important issues? Mm. Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think people very often um, confuse the two. They, when they see people who are comfortable with uncertainty, they assume that it is um, just, just apathy, right? Well, um, I mean, the first thing to note is that being comfortable with uncertainty depends upon what I've described here as, as humility, right? It really is. Um, so the, the difference is, at least in principle, and of course it can be difficult to sort of sort out and practice or to recognize the difference. But in principle, apathy means you don't think the issue matters that much, right? Um, you don't really care about the truth of the matter. You don't think there is a truth of the matter. So what, what's the point? Um, humility doesn't deny that there's a truth of the matter or even that it matters what the truth of the matter is. Um, it might matter a great deal. And the humble person is very um, desirous to be illuminated um, and desirous to see illumination happen. They want to see discussion debate happen. Um, but they know that just because there is a truth of the matter does not mean that that truth is easy to arrive at or that they themselves have arrived at it, right? Uh, and I do think, so there's, a, I think, a key difference in principle in terms of recognizing it. Perhaps the difference is what I've just said there in terms of um, the apathetic person doesn't want, isn't interested in a bunch of discussion and argument about the issue because why, 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 why are we having a discussion about this? Why are we arguing about it? Um, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Or, or what they'll say is what they tend to do is they, they, they get very concerned about argument at all. They, they think argument is intrinsically kind of hateful and divisive. And so you start having an argument about some issue and the apathetic person, the tolerant, the apathetic person who's claims tolerance says like, no, no, why are we, why are we fighting about this? We're going to cause division. We just need to all love one another and, you know, and get along. And what they're really saying is, um, I don't, you guys are making me uncomfortable because the fact that you're arguing about it shows that you actually have strong convictions or feelings about it. And, and that, that you think there is a real truth of the matter. And I don't think there is a truth of the matter. And so I don't want to hear that argument because it actually makes me, you know, uh, it makes me uncomfortable. Contrarywise, the humble person who knows how to live with certainty is not afraid of, it's because they're not afraid of, of argument or discussion. They want to see more argument and discussion because just because they don't think they've arrived at certainty doesn't mean they don't think that they could get more, right? There are a lot, there are a lot of topics, a lot of the topics I listed there, right? For instance, I'll go back to them, right? You know, that, um, you know, I said like health policy, uh, Healthcare policy, tax policy, immigration, what do the Confederate statues, meaning of Genesis 1. These are all topics on which I don't feel certain, um, but on which I love to hear discussions about them. I, 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 and I, because I think I could become more certain if I learned more about it. And I'd like to be exposed to that argument. And I, and I think the more argument we have, uh, the more we might arrive at some greater relative certainty. And so um, humility is not afraid of of conflict carried out in charity in pursuit of truth. Um, apathy is because it doesn't really believe there is a truth of the matter to be pursued. So Ben asks, um, I thought your insight about our present overwhelming amount of choice as a cause of tribalism and division is compelling. As for the increasing political division, do you think that this could be a consequence of increasing federal authority and scope in which individual citizens have less influence and a detachment from the physical place and communities in which they live? Yes, um, I mean, absolutely. I think, 
part of what you we're dealing with here is um, a whole bunch of things that could be said here, but right. Um, I mean, one, we could say we live in a time in which we experience more radical choice, more freedom of choice um, than anybody ever in history. And yet we feel, we don't feel particularly free because we feel profoundly disempowered. We feel unable to have any meaningful impact on our surroundings or on our, um, and on our, our, our government specifically. But really that's just a, the, you know, our, our sense of impotence in relation to the government is just a one piece of our general sense of uh, living in a world that is too big and too complicated and too fast moving and too um, uh, unrooted for us to, to know how to meaningfully act within it. And I actually, I have an essay on, on this I, I wrote last year in which I basically, I say, like, we need to think more about this term freedom because freedom doesn't just mean having options. It means having an ability to meaningfully act in pursuit of one of those options. And if you are aware of a bunch of options out there and you have no, don't feel like anything that you do makes a difference, then you don't experience that as freedom. And I do, I think the, um, for a whole host of reasons, the fact that, uh, I, th I think the, the shift of political power from more local levels to more federal levels is, is both a symptom of, of certain other underlying problems, but it's also a cause that exacerbates those problems. And it, it creates this sense of disempowerment and that can lead to, that can lead to apathy and just checking out entirely or it can lead to uh, resentment and this sense of if you can't accomplish change by you know by peaceful means, then you need to you need to you need to use radical means. So um, I think that's obviously a, a cause of our our polarization. I mean, you, and you could also say um, that you know when you're engaging in local politics, you are forced to interact with people of a wide spectrum of views and sort of uh, live alongside your neighbors and, and, and uh, recognize the limits of your own perspective. Whereas when you're dealing with national politics issues, uh, you're, not, you're not dealing with them along with other members of your community. You're dealing with other like-minded people um, perhaps that you, through, you know through your, your digital communities. And so you're, you're sorting yourself out into people who you already agree with, into these, these echo chambers, which is a lot easier to do when you're dealing with national politics than it is when you're doing local politics. Okay. Uh, well, we're, we're beginning to come up on time. So I think one last question ought to put us over. So I'll combine two questions. Bob writes, how do we make people not be afraid to not be certain? And in a, in a related vein, uh, somebody has anonymously asked, practically speaking, in your opinion, what formative disciplines would be most significant for children and young adults to better prepare them to attune their hermeneutic politically in church and in school? So turning okay. more to these practical questions. Yeah. So, well, the first question, I think this is in some sense uh, answered by the, the first question of all that we asked about assurance versus certainty um, is I think um, to realize, um, and how do, how do you say it? How do we, how do we become less afraid to not be certain? Right. Um, and to realize Right, how much this is a matter of fear. Um, our search for certainty comes from fear and it comes from a, and it's an attempt to shore up an identity which is insecure, right? And that's why I said, so our conflicts are really identity conflicts. We, and we, we struggle with a sense of identity in the late modern world where, um, because of this situation of radical choice and lacking that sense of identity, we try to make it up through our allegiances to these various tribes of, of doctrines and um, commitments. Well, and this is where as Christians, I mean, it sounds trite to say it, but it really, I mean, it really is true. I mean, the, the doctrine of justification by faith is, I think, 
the most powerful answer to this because if your identity is indeed secure in Christ, then you don't need to create your identity through uh, these movements that you're part of through being these, this list of doctrines that you can check the boxes um, from, you know, claims to be able to see through you, you, you're one of the group that has seen through, you know, what's really going on. You understand the the conspiracy or whatever, right? All these things in which people find their identities. um, They're trying to make up for this hole, which is often a, a, a spiritual hole. And uh, I think, I mean, Luther is very powerful on this. And, and I think Hooker is in many ways trying to, this is what he's trying to say to the Puritans. is like, we need to get back to the gospel. And when we do that, then these conflicts are going to become more manageable. And it sounds trite, but I mean, I think it, it really is. Um, it's certainly true in my own experience. Um, but I, I think it's also, we learn by, and this is, I'm going to, this, probably answers to some extent the second question we learn by example and and for me this has been most of all by example how have i learned to be more comfortable with the limits of my own knowledge is by being in the presence of other christian men who have modeled that and it's jarring it's jarring and we're not used to it and in fact it's the funny thing is it often comes across comes across as arrogance sometimes um because um, because it's calm and it's secure. The person the person who is in fact secure in their limits of their knowledge um, has this calm confidence that at first glance can look to other people like arrogance. Like they oh they must have all the answers. They think they have all the answers. No, it's precisely because they know they don't have all the answers that they they can be relaxed about it. And it's a really rare thing in the Christian world today. But when you see it, um, it can be very freeing because then you realize that you don't need to have all the answers either. Um, and so, I mean, my, my biggest answer is find, find those people in your church, um, in your community that have modeled this ability to blend. Um, it's not apathy, right? Like I said, it's not apathy. It's not, um, it's not just like skepticism for the sake of skepticism. It is a calm, confident resting on Christ and what he has revealed and a patience with him that he will reveal what we need um, and that what he has not revealed, uh, at least not, has not revealed as fully as we like, means that we don't need it or rather, or, or, or that at least he is inviting us to discover it and figure it out. And um, yeah, those, those people who can model that, I think, can help us gain it in ourselves. And so in terms of, you know, for children, I think the biggest thing for parents is, I think parents are very often afraid to admit to their kids when they don't know things particularly about matters of faith. I mean, kids are can be really jarring in their ability to ask really difficult theological questions from quite early on. And um, I've, it's, it's been humbling to me as someone who, you know, has a PhD in theology to find how often they ask something and I'm like, I don't know. Um, or I, I kind of know, but I don't have to know. I don't know as well as I thought I did. Um, and sometimes I can say, I don't know because, and I, I think um, the, the reason I don't think I know is because I actually think that God hasn't really made the answer to this question clear. And this is something Christians disagree on. We need to, you didn't, I want my kids to know that this is something that Christians disagree on and I might have a view, but um, I'm not, I, I may have, I may not be certain of it myself. So I, I think, um, I mean, that, that could sound kind of wishy-washy, or anything, but I think, I mean, if anyone knows me, I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a conservative, confessional, reformed guy right here. You know, I'm not, um, I'm not like, um, you know, at, wondering, you know, I don't know, did Jesus really rise from the dead? And it's not, I'm not talking about that, that sort of thing, right? But I think there are all sorts of things in which our kids have lots of questions that if we're honest with ourselves, we don't have the answers to that we think that we do. And I think it's really important for our kids to see that and to know that, and I think many Christian parents are worried that if they 
show any sort of chink in their armor that that's going to, um, um, you know, provoke a crisis of faith in their kids. Uh, but I think if the kids see that, no, you have a calm, confident faith resting on Christ securely, uh, and yet you're acknowledging your limitations, uh, that could be very powerful for them. So that's all I have for now. All right. Well, that puts us just a few minutes over time. So we'll end here. So thank you everyone for joining us for this lecture. Thank you, Dr. Littlejohn. It was a wonderful lecture. And we hope that this has inspired you all to, to follow the work of the Davenant Institute. And we hope to see you at lectures like this in the future. <laughs>